Welcome to the Starfleet Leadership Academy, a Star Trek podcast told through the lens of leadership development. And now, here's your host, Jeff Aiken. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. After our last episode, I am, I am really hoping for a good one. I'll be honest here, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one that always remembers an episode just from its title. So let's head into this one together as we check out Season 1, Episode 20 or 27, depending on where you're watching it, of the original series, The Alternative Factor. It's a boring routine day on Enterprise. What? You thought, you thought they had awesome, cool adventures all the time? No, I'd, I'd say almost all the time it's just, you know, just another day at work for them. Today, they're cataloging and scanning planets, and this looks like it's about as boring as they come. Iron silicon base, oxygen, hydrogen, atmosphere, largely arid, no discernible life, no surprises. I actually, I actually love this open. Not every minute of every day is exciting. In fact, they're mostly boring and routine, right? Hello, Peter. What's happening? I think that... Oftentimes, when we think of leadership, we think about these moments, these important and intense moments where, where, where someone is having a crisis or where, where you're working diligently to unlock the potential in someone. But the reality is, most of, it, most of it's just kind of showing up and being there. In fact, I remember one of my first upper management jobs. I'd, I'd worked as a line supervisor for years and, and, and finally had a position where the, where the supervisors reported to me. Like, this, this is the good stuff, right? Well, one day, I finish up an email, and I realize I don't really have any work to do that, that, that I have to do right away. There isn't a line of things just waiting for me, which, which honestly, honestly might say a lot more about the need for the layers and layers of management than anything else. So, well, really, but the, reality, the reality is here, I had nothing pressing to do for, for the rest of the day. I swung by my boss's desk, and, and I let him know. And his response was interesting, and in a way, reflected here with what we see in Kirk. He said, sometimes, leadership is just being there. So it's not always these exciting moments. It's not always even working on a one-pager or a report. Sometimes it's, it's just showing up. And in this moment, that's about all Kirk has done. Spock, the cartography team, the sensor team, they, they've got everything under control. Kirk's pretty much just being there. About four more orbits ought to do it, Mr. Leslie. That'll wrap it up. Lay in a course for Starbase 200. And it's a good thing, too, because it all falls apart. Two huge impacts to the ship. They are rocking and rolling. Rocking and rolling and whatnot. Spock analyzes, and Kirk tries to get the meat of, of what just happened. I want facts, not poetry. I have given you the facts, Captain. Spock says it is as if the entire magnetic system in the solar system just blinked. For a split second, nothing existed. And now, at the very moment stuff went down, there's a living humanoid creature on the planet's surface, when before, there were none. Kirk puts together an away team, and they head to the surface. They locate a small, one-person ship crashed on the surface. Looks like it came from any sci-fi show in the 1950s. They investigate, but before they can reach inside, the human, a man, yells at them, saying he needs help. Need the help! Suddenly, he falls from a cliff. Ah! Kirk has him beamed directly to sickbay. On the ship, we learn the dilithium crystals were drained from the phenomenon. Kirk orders them to be recharged. Spock, in the meantime, learns that the phenomenon was centered directly on this planet. Mahura gets a hail from Starfleet Command. Code Factor 1, sir. That means invasion status. At the time of this episode, that was, that was just a way to add some stakes to the show. But now that we have decades of Star Trek after this, th this makes total sense. Okay, spoiler time, alert warning, if you have not watched Discovery yet, the first season shows the start and the end of the Federation Klingon War. This particular episode, The Alternative Factor, occurs on Stardate 3087.6, which is sometime in the year 2267. The war ended just 10 years prior in 2257. And in that war, although victorious, the Federation was decimated. 
They would understandably still be on a high alert when it came to a potential invasion. In fact, just a, just a few episodes from the alternative factor, spo- sorry, spoiler alert again here, there's a conflict with the Klingons once again. The addition of Discovery, well, 23rd century Discovery, changes and enhances a lot of the little details like this in the original series. Kirk puts the crew on battle stations. All hands is the captain. Battle stations. I repeat, battle stations. This is no drill. And takes the message from Starfleet Command. Commodore Barstow comes on, lets them know this disruption impacted every quadrant of the galaxy. Kirk postulates this is the prelude to an invasion. Commodore agrees. He orders Enterprise to determine what's happening. They happen to be the only ship in the area because they're evacuating all personnel near the solar system, so they are on their own. Kirk pauses for just a moment. Like many of Kirk's flashes of brilliance, this happens very quickly. The communication ends, and he takes a beat just to, just to breathe. So far, this episode has tried really hard to make us believe this is a big deal. Like the entire Federation is at stake, and they are on the brink of war. To add to it all, Kirk was just told he's pretty much on his own in staving this off. But he's a pro, and he's accustomed to being given difficult assignments. But this, this is huge. He doesn't really have time to digest the whole thing, so he, so he does two things. And, and these are both things that you can put into practice today, immediately. First, he stops, pauses, and takes a breath. This may not seem significant, but really, it is, it is huge. Dr. Christopher Rhodes, a clinical neuropsychologist at Harborview Medical Center, says taking a breath, a deep breath specifically, helps to calm your nerves and reduce stress and anxiety. But how does it do that? Okay, biology lesson. Your autonomic nervous system, which controls involuntary actions, this is like keeping your heart beating, digestion, things like that, is split into two parts. One part, the sympathetic nervous system, controls your fight or flight response. The other part, the parasympathetic nervous system controls your rest and relax response. These two parts of your nervous system can't be turned on at the same time, which means if you work to activate one, the other will be suppressed. And stopping to take a breath activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Do you think Kirk might be feeling a little stress and anxiety right now? Maybe his sympathetic nervous system is in control? Yeah, I'd imagine so. Now, to fully reap the benefits of deep breathing, it's a focused exercise that can take some time, like at least 60 seconds. But Kirk doesn't have that kind of time, and I'm sure you don't always have it either. But just the act of sitting comfortably, closing your eyes, and taking an intentional deep breath can help reset your mind so you can focus on next steps. And that, that is the second thing he does. He immediately leans on his expert, Spock, and goes through what they know. From the top, Mr. Spock. This accomplishes a few things. First, in the spirit of the deep breathing we just talked about, it helps to calm you down. Being told you're on the brink of invasion and that you alone can stop it can impact your stress levels just a little bit. Like, in a completely and totally overwhelming way. But going through the facts, reviewing what is known and and, and what is not known, gives you an objective list that can dilute that overwhelmed feeling. Another critical thing it accomplishes is providing action items, or next steps. By stepping through everything, they know they have more to learn on the planet. That's going to be Spock's responsibility. And they have more to learn from the human they found. That'll be Kirk's responsibility. Instead of panicking or exciting everyone around him needlessly, Kirk worked to calm himself, determine next steps, and took immediate action. Kirk's talking with the man, Lazarus, in sickbay. He describes a a horrible, murderous monster that he's been chasing as it destroyed his entire civilization. He's horrified by this thing, and and, and he calls its destruction... My holy cause! So Kirk, with that information, joins Spock and his team. They're going to try and validate as much of Lazarus' story as they can. Visual inspection, scans of the planet reveal there are no other life forms. Spock, Spock straight up calls him out on being a liar. I've simply made the logical deduction that you are a liar. In this, we experience another disturbance, this time localized on the planet and specifically on Lazarus. We spend an uncomfortable amount of time watching some late 60s special effects that, that, that kind of look like two guys 
sort of fighting and awkward slow motion. Oh, and it and it just goes on forever. 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 When it finally ends, the planet is shaking, there's lightning, and Lazarus, alone, collapses to the ground. Lazarus is beaten up pretty badly. He's fired up, though, and he wants Kirk to join him in his fight. Kill! 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 Yikes. McCoy patches Lazarus up. Looks like glitter band-aids will still be a thing in the future. Kirk and Spock, again, talk through what has happened. While they don't believe there's another person, Lazarus's wounds tell a different story. Spock confirms that the disturbances occur at the exact moment Lazarus claims to have had his battles with this thing. As before, they agree there's still a lot to learn as McCoy calls Kirk to sickbay. McCoy's worried. He knows that he treated Lazarus for wounds and lacerations. As we both know, I'm a bright young medic with a miraculous touch. Mm -hmm. But after just a few minutes... He shows no signs of them. It's, it's as if he's ne- he'd never been injured. He left sick bay on his own, and he headed to a crew lounge. Hi. Hi. Coffee? Is that an order, Lieutenant? <laughs> I know what you mean. I always like these little scenes where you see the crew hanging out like normal. And in here, they're, they're, they're just spending time together, talking about their work, and they mention the work they're doing to recharge the dilithium crystals. An unbandaged Lazarus overhears, and he tries to follow them, but he ends up having another disturbance, another incident. This one is mercifully much shorter, but when he comes out of it, he's bandaged up again. At that very moment, Kirk and McCoy find him. Kirk is not pleased at all. I have a ship's physician with a strange sense of humor. No, but this is no joke, Jim. I I know what I saw. Kirk takes Lazarus to the bridge with him. Spock has found a source of radiation that that is not there. I confess I am somewhat at a loss for words. He describes it as a rip, a rip in the universe. He mentions dilithium crystals, and Lazarus gets really excited. He says that with the crystals, he can trap this murderous thing that he's chasing. But Kirk refuses, saying that none of Lazarus' explanations have been believable. Upset. He leaves the bridge. I'll have my vengeance. In a relatively rare and cool Star Trek moment, we get to see dilithium crystals. Lieutenant Masters has finished recharging them, and Lazarus, Metal Gear, solids his way into engineering, takes out Masters, and snags some dilithium. In this now, we've seen Lazarus change from bandaged to unbandaged Lazarus and back again a few times. He gets picked up, and Kirk and Spock are interrogating him. The, 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 bandaged version of him, who who claims that he's not the one with the crystals. Find my enemy. Find the beast, and you'll find the crystals. Kirk puts together a landing party, along with Lazarus, to check out the planet. Again. On the planet's surface, we get a solid five minutes of people just walking around on the planet. Literally. Just scenes of people walking. And walking and walking. And then we get another 60s special effect fight scene. The planet again shaking. There's lightning. And then bandaged Lazarus falls from a cliff. Again. It's a kind of higher cliff this time though, I guess. So we go back to sick bay. Kirk questions him. Again. The crew has fact-checked Lazarus's backstory and it was all a lie. Finally, he claims that he's going to give the real story. It turns out his planet is the planet that they're orbiting. His ship is a time ship, and he's been chasing this creature through time for years. He's a time traveler. The dilithium crystals will get his ship flying again, and then he can continue the chase. So he continues to claim that the creature, though, is the one that has the crystals, not him. So McCoy keeps him secured in sickbay. Spock is determined the radiation, this radiation that comes from nowhere, actually comes from outside their universe. He and Kirk talk about the possibility of a parallel universe and come to the conclusion that universes coming into contact with each other has caused the rip, and that is what's causing the disturbances. They continue to talk and ultimately determine the Lazaruses are two different people, but only one can occupy a universe at a time. So we have plus Lazarus, no bandage, and minus Lazarus, bandage. 
They decided that they must contain them and never let them come into contact with each other or everything, absolutely everything, will be annihilated. Matter and antimatter have a tendency to cancel each other out violently. Bandaged Lazarus starts a fire in engineering so he can snag some crystals. We see the Enterprise DC team in action as Lazarus beams himself down to the planet. Kirk chases him on his own. As Lazarus loads the crystals into his ship, Kirk reaches inside and is zapped out of our universe. We get yet another painfully long negative effect, slow motion running scene that when it finally ends, finds Kirk in a similar, but, but apparently different universe. Unbandaged Lazarus is there in his crashed ship. Very calm, he's very reasonable, very much the opposite of bandaged Lazarus. Kirk explains the situation, and he, and he fully understands. He explains there's a negative energy corridor of sorts that keeps the two universes safe. He describes it as a prison with explosives at the doors. He proposes that they trap bandaged Lazarus in the corridor, along with himself, and that Kirk destroys their ships, trapping them there for eternity. He believes that this will keep both universes safe, and Kirk agrees. Kirk heads back to his universe, grabs bandaged Lazarus, and throws him into his ship, sending him into the corridor. He orders Enterprise to fire on the ship, destroying it. But what of Lazarus? What of Lazarus? We get a quick scene of plus and minus Lazarus fighting in the corridor, and Kirk orders Enterprise away. Wow. I, uh, I am, I am, I am, so, I'm so sorry. Two episodes in a row that were just terrible. I mean, at least, at least Unforgettable had Virginia Madsen going for it. This had, well, nothing. When I was a kid, I always thought of this one as the one with the guy that had a fish beard. Lazarus's makeup was, well, I'll try to be kind here. It was, um, inconsistent. Now, a lot can be forgiven in the makeup and acting departments for Lazarus. See, originally, John Drew Barrymore was supposed to play him. In a moment of prescient brilliance, he no-showed the filming. Robert Brown happened to be near the set on the second day and was literally pulled in to fill the role. With absolutely zero prep, he, he really played two different characters in a, in a really poorly written episode of a sci-fi TV show that not too many people knew about yet. Even with that grace, this, this episode is basically unwatchable. It stinks. A number of sites and publications rank this among the worst of all Star Trek, and I have to agree. Story really didn't make any sense. And I think Lazarus is changing stories. <laughs> We're kind of, that was the writers just spitballing ideas to move the episode forward. And then the ending. I mean, God, thank goodness it was over, but oh, it was awful. What of Lazarus? What of Lazarus? Yeah, what of him? He gave up his eternity for two universes. And all he gets is Kirk pondering what that would look like. While I really am sorry I subjected you to this episode, I think, though, that it shows how serious I am about watching and, and yes, learning from every episode of Star Trek. You're welcome. Command codes verified. Terrible episode or no, we can glean leadership lessons from each episode of Star Trek. At least, at least I hope we can. The first thing we talked about was a day in the life. Woke up, fell out of bed. Kirk is clearly bored in the opening scene, but he's doing the things you do when you're on a mission of exploration. To me, the lesson here for us is that leadership still has a job attached to it, usually at least. I mean, I have days where I work on a budget presentation or I review audit reports, and, and, and I can only imagine the work you do every day in your job. But for all of us, all of us, we have the grind. I mean, even Captain Kirk. But the grind is easier when you've also done the leadership stuff. The only other cast member we, we really see anything out of in this episode is Spock, but we see the benefits of training, development, trust building between him and Kirk. He creates a culture where his team is well prepared for the unexpected, even in the most routine of circumstances. The reality is, if the boring and routine stuff was the norm and nothing exciting or weird ever happened, we probably wouldn't need people in leadership positions. You see, we need leaders because the routine is shaken up 
all the time. We need to develop people and be able to respond to the unexpected. We need to develop strategic plans so we aren't lost when things go south. Running through a playbook or or running a drill on your continuity of operations plan as examples help prepare your teams for those things that, that, that fall out of the routine. We see exactly this in the open of the episode. Boring, daily routine, and then the galaxy suddenly is under threat of immediate invasion. At no point does anyone lose their cool. In fact, everyone performs at a very high level. Lieutenant Masters identifies problems with the dilithium crystals, offers a solution, and executes. Report on the dilithium crystals, Captain. Whatever that phenomenon was, it drained almost all of our crystals completely. It could mean trouble. Spock is researching the problem and looking for solutions. Everyone steps up because Kirk, and, and I'll be honest, this is an assumption on my part, but Kirk regularly drills and prepares his crew for the unexpected. He has a lot of talent on his crew and trusts his department heads to handle the technical aspects of their job. He, though, helps elevate them to top performers in all situations. Kirk and Spock are a great team. On a number of occasions, they go through an exercise that keeps them on track and solution-oriented. They go over the facts one at a time. By reviewing what they know and identifying what they don't know, it keeps them moving forward towards a solution. Like I said earlier, this is an exercise that you can use. It really helps to simplify complex issues. It also helps to maintain an objective, an objective point of view. Work with your team. Review what you know. Now, Hopefully, you're not in a situation where the entire galaxy is depending on you. So, so you, have, you, you probably have tools like performance metrics, task lists, deliverable schedules, etc. to help guide that review. But even if you don't, just taking that moment to review what you know can be extremely valuable. I really, I really enjoyed the scenes where they did this exercise. Well, well, maybe that's not entirely true. I mean, to be clear, I enjoyed these scenes a lot more than the other scenes. But I guess, I guess that really isn't saying too much. But in these scenes, it's great to watch them go from a place of confusion to a place where they have action items and are moving towards a solution. Shorter episode this time. There there honestly just wasn't a lot to review here. What are your thoughts? Let me know. I absolutely love hearing from you. I'm on all the social media at Jeff T. Aiken. Jeff T. as in terrible A-K-I-N. If you've enjoyed the Starfleet Leadership Academy, please tell a friend or tell a colleague about it. All right, now let's see what we're going to be watching next time. Working. Oh, here we go. Okay, outside of the pilot episodes, this is our first two-parter. On these, I'm going to combine the two parts into one episode so we can look at it in its entirety. And this is absolutely one of the most iconic two-parters in Star Trek The Next Generation. Season 5, Episodes 7 and 8, Unification Parts 1 and 2. Nothing wrong with more Spock. And until then, Ex Astra Scientia.